if the world was invaded by magical light creatures that'll make you end yourself just by looking at them, and a bunch of crazy people were running around trying to make you do that, what would you do? Yup, we're doing this again, only this time in Spain. Just like before, civilizations in shambles following widespread depopulation, and what few humans remain are forced to move about in total darkness to keep from losing their heads. Of course, with any kind of apocalypse, the only thing more dangerous than the monsters is your fellow man. And just to make matters worse, someone in our group is in all that he claims. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the bright side in Bird Box Barcelona. Sebastian was a father. Keyword, was. See that girl he's talking to right now? She's dead as hell. And yet, the poor sap still operates as though she's always right beside him. Dude even lets her boss him around through life and death situations. Like the way she stops him from pulling an Uno reverse on the scumbags that jacked all his canned goods. That said, it was probably for the best. Armed with nothing but a broken wine bottle, they definitely would have jacked him up. Sucks to say, but when it's three on one, unless you're packing heat, it's probably best to just give them what they want and hope that's all they're really after. Of course, now Sebastian has to find something else to eat. Lucky for him, there's still a decent amount of honest folk left alive for him to mooch off of, and he knows just how to win them over. I know where to find a generator! Works every time. Sure, who wouldn't want access to indoor lights, heating, and possibly even entertainment? But that's just the thing. It's been, what, nine months since this nightmare clacked off? And we're supposed to believe that no one, not a single other person at Sebastian's old construction company, thought to grab them already. Yes. For that matter, why wouldn't he have gone in to take them himself at some point? He says they're too heavy for one person to move, but that implies he's been alone this entire time. And I definitely don't buy that either. All this is to say, he either has no idea whether the Jennies are still there, or he's outright lying. In any case, the smart thing to do here would be to tell him to kick rocks and wheel our can carts back to base before the glowing ones roll in. Possible deceptions aside, without the aid of eyesight, we have no way of sizing up strangers out in the field. And for all we know, he's armed to the teeth after looting an old military checkpoint. And even if he's not, there's always is the possibility he's dropping a line for all his raider friends to follow later on. But because the thought of watching old soap operas with microwaved popcorn is simply too tempting to pass up, the foragers agree to let Sebastian on board their little gravy train. Little do they realize it'll be their last mistake. Married nerds, show all the women out there that you're a taken man with a premium wedding band from this video sponsor, The Ridge. With its rounded outer beveled edge, convex comfortable no pinch fit and scratch resistant PVD coating. The Ridge Ring has a solid weighty feel, looks sexy, and is built to last longer than your vow of till death do us part. Don't put fake garbage on your finger. Compliment your babe of a wife with a ring that looks as good as she does. Like with this 24 karat gold tungsten core Ridge Ring. Sometimes people change though. What was the perfect match before just isn't now. It's not her, it's you. That's why Ridge has a never lost and forever fit protection. Whether you lose your ring or lose 20 pounds, they've got you covered. Each purchase of a Ridge ring comes with the option of two future exchanges for the same ring in the same or different size. The rings come in a variety of premium metals like carbon fiber, tungsten carbide, and titanium, as well as any color that fits your vibe and look. The Ridge knows that while you can clean up nice and can rock that gold tungsten and dual band. You also need a more flexible, casual option for when you're swinging axe. That's why every ring set includes a high quality Ridge silicone band. Go to ridge.com slash nerdexplains. Use code nerdexplains for 10% off and pick yourself up a ring worthy of you and your wife. Later that night, after receiving medical attention from the camp doctor, Sebastian settles in for dinner in a show alongside his newfound friends. Tonight's performance is a very visibly blind man sharing the story of his encounter with a group of raiders who sought to show the others the light, so to speak. Evidently, they had all seen the creatures, but were somehow spared the usual fate, and they were dead set on making that everyone else's problem. According to the old man, he only managed to survive 
survive by taking a knife to his own eyeballs. After which, the attackers simply lost interest in him. Awesome story, bro. You know, you'd think a bunch of people with access to this information would be less trusting of strangers. It'd probably be wise to set up some kind of quarantine area with limited privileges where newcomers would reside until they proved their loyalty. At the very least, they probably shouldn't be allowed to sleep in the same bus with everyone else, especially when all the keys are left lying out in the open. Sebastian. Well, that's not good. Fortunately, he only barred the door with a flimsy metal spoon, so it isn't all that difficult for the others to pry their way in. However, where they go wrong is attempting to take control of the moving vehicle without incapacitating the driver. Instead, we should have put Sebastian in a blood choke by wrapping an armor, some kind of ligature around his neck. If this doesn't immediately cause him to let go of the wheel, he'll be out cold in a matter of seconds, allowing us to steer the bus in a safe direction while we drag him out of the seat. At the same time, someone should try and place the bus in neutral to prevent him from accelerating into the nearest wall. Of course, none of this would even be necessary had the survivors stripped the bus for parts as soon as they moved in. Seriously, what are you gonna do with these things? Drive them by braille? As I mentioned way back in my original Bird Box video, navigating a vehicle blindfolded would be pretty much impossible, even with the aid of GPS guidance systems and proximity sensors, none of which they have with them today. Besides, think of all the useful stuff that could pull off these things. Hell, given the right technical knowledge, they could have built their own generators using the engines. And most importantly, it would have prevented this from happening. <laughs> Nice one, Bo. Then again, this might have been the plan all along. With everyone dead, he won't have to worry about them poking holes in his bullshit generator story. It's the perfect crime. However, this is where we discover the true nature of Sebastian's sinister plan. Turns out, the real purpose behind this joyride was to force everyone out into the open for a little show and tell. That's right, our guy was working for the light demons all along. And you'll never guess who they've got pulling his strings. You saved them, Dad. Their souls are free now. Yeah, dude, you totally saved them. After all, nothing says salvation like the sight of a grown woman mindlessly feeding herself into a wheel well. Still, I gotta wonder why none of the survivors thought to immediately cover their eyes once they were outside. Clearly, they never anticipated an unvetted stranger might try and harm them in any way. But you'd think they'd at least want to keep their blindfolds handy in case of a sudden breach in their defenses. Oh, well. Well, too late for any of that now. As for Sebastian, seems the Lord's work is never done. According to Anna, there's still plenty of lost souls out there in need of saving. And if he helps just a few more find their way to an early grave, he'll finally be reunited with his family. It's the classic make us whole again routine running the show. And just like Isaac Clark, Sebastian's willing to do whatever it takes to make that happen. Which brings us to our next merry band of survivors. However, Unlike the first group, these guys don't play around with security. <laughs> Seriously, dude, how can you expect these people to blindly follow you to their doom once they catch you lurking like that? Lucky for him, the same woman, Claire, he was just creeping up on, is willing to completely disregard all the obvious red flags and bring him into the fold without a second thought. Her companions, on the other hand, need a little bit of convincing, but that's nothing the old generator line can't fix. Back at the survivor's base, Sebastian suddenly finds himself faced with something he's never encountered before. This being actual follow-up questions about the state and location of the aforementioned generators. Worse yet, he's suddenly overcome by the realization he won't be able to draw all six of them out at once on the retrieval mission. Because, of course he won't. Still, why is that even an issue? Take however many you can first and then wait for the others to come out searching for them once no one returns. You could even change your voice up a bit to make them think you're a totally new person. How would they be able to tell without taking off their blindfolds. Whatever the case, the mounting pressure forces Sebastian to finally come clean about the equipment. But just as he's about to get thrown out on his ass, the universe lends him a hand in the form of little orphan Sophie. What? Oh! She's asking you not to hurt me. 
Oh, sure. Let's all take orders from the one person who knows the absolute least about the reality of human nature. I'm sure she's an excellent judge of character. And sure enough, the girl's act of defiance is all it takes for them to completely disregard Sebastian's betrayal and allow him to stay. Never mind the fact that they have no food and just accepted another hungry mouth to feed. The only upside here is that this mouth also speaks German, so at least they can finally figure out what Sophia's deal is. Turns out, she was on a cruise with her mom when a bunch of their fellow passengers started yeeting themselves into the ship's propellers. Somehow, the two of them managed to escape the chaos and make it back ashore where they learned of a sanctuary up on a nearby mountain. But before they could make it onto the gondola leading up to the top, she and her mom became separated. And the rest is history. Naturally, upon hearing about this potential haven, the group immediately considers abandoning the established safety of their Civil War bomb shelter to walk blindfolded up the nearest mountain, which is, of course, completely insane. First of all, everything she just told you idiots happened about nine months ago. So for all you know, things have long since fallen apart up there. And even if there's still people hanging around, we know the only way up is by gondola, which requires what to operate? Electricity. Now, given the effectiveness of Sebastian's generator ruse, I'm guessing power is pretty hard to come by these days. So how can we be sure the cable cars are even operational at this point? Wandering the street blindfolded is hard enough. Can you even imagine what climbing hand over hand would be like? This bunker is no paradise, for sure, but as long as it keeps the creatures out, we should focus our efforts on scrounging up canned goods and holding out until the situation changes, or until we get third-party confirmation that such a safe place still exists. Besides, we've all lasted this long, right? He's right. We can't stay down here forever. The mere fact you are currently still breathing suggests otherwise. Look, I'm not entirely opposed to relocating, but nothing says we have to do it right away. Instead, we need to continue doing what we're doing until one of us finds a radio we can use to scan the airwaves. After all, if there really is a sanctuary taking in refugees out there, they'll almost certainly be advertising. Plus, they might be broadcasting special instructions on how to make it inside, or even warnings about potential hazards along the way. What if the gondola station is completely covered in sour or bright crawlers, or they've set up some other means of reaching the top. As for how we get our hands on a radio, obviously finding anything while blindfolded is no easy task, but I'd start by searching for abandoned vehicles and trying the door handles. Eventually, we're bound to find one that's unlocked, at which point we'll cover up all the windows and either hotwire it or use the keys if they're available. Unfortunately, with how much time has passed, most car batteries will probably be dead. But unless we can feel our way to the Spanish equivalent of a Bass Pro Shop, that's pretty much the best chance we have at finding what we need. However, instead of doing anything even remotely resembling due diligence, the gang decides they have to leave as soon as possible. After everyone gets a good night's sleep, of course. And because everyone suddenly trusts him implicitly, Sebastian is allowed to crash alongside everyone else, providing him the perfect opportunity to sabotage the dog harnesses. Great. You know, it might get cold, depending on the time a year, but if you can't see either way, traveling at night would be a much better option. For one thing, you won't have to worry about sun exposure or heat exhaustion if it's the middle of summer, and it also make it much more difficult for the other seers, like Sebastian, to spot them along the way. He already mentioned having an encounter with these people to cement his cover story, so the others should definitely be concerned about the possibility of running into them. Despite having no real reason to do so, the gang sets out the first thing in the morning to begin their little self-delete mission. And for a while, things go fairly well. I gotta admit, breaking into apartment buildings and raiding the mailboxes to figure out their location is pretty clever. Furthermore, their use of trained guard dogs as an early warning system gives them a massive advantage over your typical wanderers. Dogs in general aren't nearly as hindered by vision loss as their human counterparts. Don't get me wrong, they still bump into a wall here and there, but their keen senses of hearing and 
smell will allow them to detect potential threats long before we could ever possibly hear them ourselves. Sadly, it seems Rafa's training skills need some work, as the moment they run into one of the creatures, both dogs completely disregard all commands and take off running. Still, none of that would have been possible were it not for the snake in the grass currently bringing up the rear. Although, judging by panicked screaming of the terrified travelers, a couple missing Malinois are about to be the least of their problems. Turns out, you don't actually have to see the monsters for them to reach inside your head, which is why everyone's currently being tormented by the sounds of their worst living memories. All except Rafa, that is. All he hears are the frantic whimpers of his ailing pooches, or so he thinks. <laughs> Jesus. Like, I get risking certain death to save your doggo. Believe me, I do. But once you saw nothing was there, why would you not immediately put your blindfold back on? Worse yet, why would you then proceed to look up and over your shoulder? You already know what's back there, and it's definitely not a dog. I don't care how well trained they are. Fortunately, despite Sebastian's sabotage, the Glowies failed to psyop anyone else into embracing the unalive, allowing the rest of the survivors to hole up in a nearby by building, but not before old man Roberto catches a nasty bite from one of Rafa's newly enlightened canines. As for Sebastian himself, it's unclear why he wouldn't have run up to everyone in their state of confusion and simply ripped their blindfolds off. There's literally nothing they could have done to stop him if he had. The only reason I can think of is that he plans to pull one over on whoever might still be up on the mountain, but even then, why would he need the others to get him there? Sebastian can look at whatever he wants. I mean, if anything, the others are just holding him back. And speaking of boat anchors, it isn't long before the wound on Roberto's hand becomes infected, and you know what that means. Long sleeve. Soft sleeve. Let me have a look. We're gonna have to find some antibiotics to bring his temperature down. What? No, dude is totally fu- do you have any idea how hard it will be to scrounge up the proper meds while running around blindfolded? You'll just be risking healthy lives to save someone who doesn't stand a chance. Seriously, how many times are you people gonna let something as immaterial as empathy threaten your very survival? Honestly, at this point, I'm hoping Sebastian follows through on his mission from God, lest these dopes actually make it to the hypothetical sanctuary. Last thing we need is one of them letting the creatures in because it's cold outside. The only good news here is that we seem to be in an apartment building, so at least we don't have to risk another trip outside during this particular fool's errand. Not yet, anyway. That said, we should still keep our blindfolds on at all times as we move through the building. After all, someone might have left open a window. Is your room secure? Yes. Dude, did you not see the six-story drop right in front of you? Matter of fact, even without taking his blindfold off, how did he not hear and or feel the breeze blowing through the curtains directly in his face? It's literally the first thing Claire notices after coming in to investigate the commotion. Although, it seems she totally missed the part where Sebastian loudly announced the room was clear right before Octavio met his end. I swear, it's almost too easy, and apparently Seabass agrees, as he completely ignores ignores his ghost daughter's command to rip Claire's blindfold off and instead follows her back down to the others. I mean, sure, there's no sport in it, but don't you want to see your wife and daughter again? Do it for her, man. Come on. Back downstairs, Claire administers the antibiotic ointment they traded a man's life for. And while it probably couldn't hurt, I'm pretty sure it's too late for Neosporin alone once a fever sets in. That said, I'm definitely not a doctor, so medical nerds, feel free to jump in down in the comments. Whatever the case, Roberto's magically feeling a lot better all of a sudden, allowing what's left of the survivors to continue on their path towards possible salvation. However, in doing so, they soon find themselves in the sights of more seers. And these guys make Sebastian look like Mother Teresa. Come on, come on! Stop! You can't leave them behind! No, we 100% can. And if we don't want to end up getting neuralized right beside them, that's exactly what we're going to do. As for Isabel and Roberto, at least they'll have a chance to look into each other's eyes one last time before savagely smashing their own brains out against the cobblestones. Yes, I'm sure Octavia would be pleased knowing he gave up his life so this could happen less than 20 minutes later. And speaking of Octavio's untimely death, Claire 
finally realizes Sebastian might have had a hand in it after noticing his signature welding goggles aren't fully blacked out. Naturally, this makes her very upset, and while I totally understand where she's coming from, the fact of the matter is, he did just save her and Sophia from throwing their lives away in an act of senseless compassion. Does that mean they can trust him completely? Absolutely not. Dude's clearly unhinged, and the way he's having it out with his invisible daughter right now doesn't exactly inspire any confidence. But as the saying goes, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And that makes the two-eyed man some kind of god. Ultimately, Claire and Sophia have no other choice, especially once the rest of the seers hone in on their location. There's simply no possible way they could evade capture without being able to see. And in that case, I'd much rather risk a potential betrayal than stumble blindly into certain death. That said, he still has to deal with the pursuers, and they don't play around when it comes to deliverance. Hello, beautiful. Just leave her alone. Yeah, or what? Or you're gonna fly. That's what. Seriously, though, that's some pretty menacing dialogue for someone who is supposedly here to help. I mean, you'd think they'd want to use a more inviting tone to try and put their victims at ease. Maybe even convince them the other side isn't so bad, so they don't put up as much of a fight. Matter of fact, the Seer's entire operation is totally backwards. Instead of rounding people up by force and leaving their corpses to rot in the sun, they should set up a series of safe houses throughout the area and lure folks in with the promise of food and shelter. They could even send teams of Judas goats out into the city to spread the word and lead people back, at which point they'd be brought before one of the light bringers and <clears throat> saved. Sure, it might not be as fun as chasing down small bands of survivors and ripping off their blindfolds, but it's bound to save on resources, not to mention turnover. Let's face it, no way What's-Her-Name was the first one to wind up road pizza in the pursuit of fresh meat, and given the way most people immediately swallow their own heads at the first sign of light, I'd imagine it's pretty difficult to find replacements. Getting back to our heroes, Sebastian uses his special being able to see powers to find them a working vehicle, and the three make their way to the gondola station with a truckload of seers hot on their tail. Lucky for them, the turncoat has a plan. <laughs> I'd say that pretty much explains it. What I don't understand, however, is Sebastian's decision to stay back and hold the line while Claire and Sophia make their way to the platform. I mean, I realize a valiant last stand against the big bad is vital to his redemption arc, but how can he be sure activating the cable cars won't require eyesight? The burning car blocking the only entrance should slow the Sears down long enough for them to get a solid head start, and provided he can find a weapon, it'll be much easier to fend off the attack as they funnel up the staircase than it would be down on level ground where they could potentially surround him. But, oh well, I guess we're dead set on doing things the hard way. And by the looks of it, so is the final boss. Kick his ass, Seabass! Well, that's gotta be the end of it, right? I mean, surely if the spear through the abdomen didn't get him, being thrust into a fireball would do the trick. However, what Sebastian fails to realize is that the fire is actually CGI, giving Father Esteban a chance to strike back with a stake to the leg. Although, even still, all he'd really have to do is work that length of rebar side to side, and the holy man would be leaking like a sieve. Instead, Sebastian opts to run himself through with the same piece of steel, thereby insta-killing his foes somehow at the cost of his own life. This, of course, totally makes up for the fact he brutally murdered countless innocent people over the last several months and guarantees him safe passage into the afterlife, where he'll finally be reunited with his family. I'm joking, of course. He's in hell. Meanwhile, up on the tower, Claire managed to fire up the gondolas by signaling the sanctuary, but shoddy construction work has left a slight gap between them and the passing cars. And with one of the monsters, closing in behind them, the only option left is a leap of faith. <laughs> Nah, we know they totally made it. And with that, the last two survivors finally reached their salvation. And they didn't even have to burn themselves alive or jump in front of a passing train. What's more, Sophia finally gets to see her mom again. Because of course she does. And we also learn that the bat 
crazy scientists here are keeping one of the creatures to run experiments on, which I'm sure Claire will eventually try and set free because she thinks it's mean. In the end, almost everyone wound up dead. However, had both survivor groups exercised better judgment in their dealings with strangers, they never would have allowed Sebastian to join them, thereby preventing this entire mess from happening in the first place. That said, once he joined the group and convinced them to relocate, all they had to do was keep their wits about them and travel exclusively at night. And there's a chance they could have reached their destination with a minimal loss of life. For that reason, I think Bird Box Barcelona was beat. Moral of the story, compassion kills.